Can you guys hear me? Yes, hi. 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 Look at so everyone wave hi to Allison Camerata. <laughs> hi, I'm Allison. Sorry to keep you guys. We had a busy news day and then it took longer to get home. Um, but I've been really looking forward to talking to you guys. Oh, we are so, okay, Allison, this is Sherry West, and I'm here with my daughter, Olivia, Hi. and we're going to be beginning the interview with you before we allow the girls to ask some questions, but we're so honored to have you here with us today. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule. And I first want to just quickly highlight that having you here was made possible by our program director, Allison Waller, who really demonstrated the live girl value of bravery by approaching you at a recent event and asking you uh, if you would come talk to our girls. And my understanding from Allison is that with no hesitation, you said absolutely yes. So thank you so much um, for joining us today. Because she sold it. Allison was so great. I mean, not only did she approach me, she gave me the elevator pitch. Like, we deal with you know middle schoolers up to high schoolers. It's a group of girls. It's trying to teach them leadership and empowerment. I was like, oh, I'm in. You know how? Where can I sign up? It was. Oh, great. that's fantastic! And so, ladies, we've already covered our first lessons this morning. One, never be afraid to ask for something, and two, sell it. Give your elevator pitch. <laughs> so thank you. Let's, totally, let's, that's really valuable. Um, just for the benefit of our girls, let's just back up and like. I know most of us know you and, and we're all big fans, but let's just give you a little bit of a formal introduction so our girls really know all that you've accomplished. Obviously, you're one of America's most celebrated journalists, an, an author, a mother of three, and a Connecticut resident. And honestly, I can't think of a better, more powerful role model for girls and women. So, Olivia, do you want to read a little bit of Allison's bio? Of course. Allison Camerata is an award-winning journalist and author. She's the co-anchor of CNN's signature morning show, New Day. In her decades-long TV career, Camerata has covered scores of major news stories, both internationally and domestically. From presidential races to terror attacks, Camerata has been on the front lines of the reporting. She's been twice nominated for Emmy Awards and won the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Award for her coverage of Hurricane Maria. So thanks again for joining us, Allison. My pleasure, and I love what you guys are doing. I mean, this whole project and the idea that you've put it together, the two of you, it's so valuable. You know, I know we're gonna to get to this, but I am at the moment trying to write my second book and it would be a memoir about these very years. The girls who are joining us right now, it would be starting in my adolescence through, through high school. And so I am like steeped right now in all of these feelings and emotions and looking back at my journals from that time and looking back at my letters. So I feel like very akin to the experiences that girls are having right now. Absolutely. And in terms of our mission of building confident leaders and inclusive leaders, there really has been no more important time in history than right now. Um, so again, we're so honored to have you here because it's role models like you who show these girls what's possible. Um, so you. with that, um, let's, you wanna jump into the yeah. questions? So Allison, I myself am a journalist and editor in chief for my school newspaper. So like, it's truly an honor to interview you. Um, could you tell us what it's like to be a news anchor and walk us through your daily routine? Okay, I would love to, because I like to, I mean, it's the best career in the world, I think. It has served me really well, and I love it. But I do like to prepare young women for what's involved, because it's not easy. So every morning, my alarm goes off at 3.15 a.m., <laughs> and, and <laughs> full stop. Um, and I get up and now in this moment of coronavirus, I don't have a big staff anymore. Everybody is working from home. I still go into the city. So I go into Manhattan every day, but no longer are there any hair and makeup people. No longer am I, you know, right next to my producers. So we've had to take all these precautions. So I, uh, I have a very, very busy morning and my busiest hour is 4 a.m. till 5 a.m. And during that hour, I am cramming for the exam. If you've ever taken a final exam, this is what I have every single morning. And I liken it to having to prepare for an oral report in front of a million people, because that's the, the number of viewers 
And so um, I'm doing tons of research. I'm studying. I'm reading all sorts of different articles. My producer is sending me all kinds of statistics and reports and research. And I'm just trying to consume it as much as possible. And then at uh, 6 a.m., the light goes on. And I am in a now in a little studio by myself. And I'm just doing probably, I don't know, nine to 12 interviews every morning. And I better have my facts down because that's what journalism is all about, is trying to get the facts out to the viewers. So it's high pressure, high stress, but it also has a big purpose. I and mean, I certainly feel the purpose right now. Every morning people are tuning in to find out what's happening with coronavirus. Is my state getting worse or better? Are more people dying? Are fewer people dying? Is there any new vaccine? So I feel the purpose of being a journalist really strongly with just trying to get all the info out to people. And then I do the show from six to nine. The camera goes off. I start preparing for the next day. Um, you know, sometimes I have meetings, sometimes I have things, you know, great talks like this. And then I come home and I'm with my kids. I just, well, part of why I was late, I just had to walk the dog. <laughs> and so all of the regular things happen, you know, at home in terms of getting ready for dinner, helping the kids with their homework. And then um, I start doing my homework. You know, I have a couple of hours of homework every night uh, from like 6.30 to 8.30. And then I have to be lights out in bed asleep by 8.30. Wow. <laughs> but thank you for walking us through that because I think that really helps us appreciate when we tune in at 6 a.m. or maybe it's closer to 7 a.m. <laughs> and really to learn, um, it really helps us appreciate everything that you're doing to prepare. And on that note, um, I'd just like to talk a little bit more. It's obviously right now such a tough news cycle, emotional news cycle, with the global pandemic you mentioned, the Black Lives Matter protests, also a presidential election cycle. Um, but yet you're so committed to this role of fair and factual reporting, which is so important to serve the public good. Can you just talk about the journalist's role today in this very, very complicated world? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that it's changed that much in terms of having to get the facts out and trying to have a real adherence to the truth. One thing that journalists also are tasked with is being a watchdog of government. And I think that right now, I think there's some confusion about that. But we have always, I mean, since the beginning of journalism in this country, since the press, we are the watchdogs to make sure that our elected officials are doing what they say they're doing and are not engaged in corruption, are not trying to somehow trick the public. So we're holding their feet to the fire. That's our job. You know, sometimes, I mean, I've interviewed President Trump many times and, you know, he has told me that at times that he thinks I'm being mean to him. And I've had to explain to him, this is our job. We have to point out if we see hypocrisy, we have to point out if we see um, corruption or something that looks like corruption, we have to ask tough questions. And it's not that we don't like somebody or we don't like the president or um, a Congress person. It's that that's what people count on the press to do, because mm -hmm. otherwise you don't know that your taxpayer dollars are being spent right, et cetera. So um, anyway, so that our job has not changed in that way. But you're right that it has gotten harder in terms of every single day of having to deal with the mounting death toll and the illness. And of course, we might even know people who have gotten sick or who have died there is a whole another emotional component to this. And as journalists, we're not supposed to inject ourselves into the story. We're not supposed to be emotional. But, you know, I find that nowadays people forgive us. You know, if I've done a few um, interviews lately where I've actually started to tear up or cry during the interview because it's so heartbreaking what we're hearing about people's loss and about these, all the wonderful people, even young people, who are being lost. And so I feel like if I get teary or get, you know, somehow well up during it, the, the audience forgives me. They don't, they don't mind that. They're feeling it at home also. Mm -hmm. So that's not my role, but it's just happening. And I think that uh, in this day and age, people understand that, you know, journalists it can be emotional and we are humans and I'm just trying to be empathetic and to connect with all the people that we interview. 
Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And I just want to say that we, the people, truly appreciate your role in the fair and factual reporting and asking the tough questions. Um, and I agree with you. I think your fans, one of the many, many reasons they love you so much is that, is that you are so yeah. authentic and you yeah. connect with, with these topics. So thank you. Thank yeah. you for that. And speaking of this emotionally draining news cycle, according to the Pew Research Center, 90% of news news that Americans hear is negative. So why do you think like bad news sells? And what's your advice to ensure that people consume like a balanced news diet? By definition, news is hard stuff. By definition, we cover the plane crashes, we cover the diseases, we cover the violence, we cover, um, you know, as I said, corruption. By definition, news is is something that is unusual. It's, it's the missing child. It's, it's all of that stuff. And, and I understand, I have people all the time tell me like, oh God, I don't know how you can take it. You know, it's all so negative. But I think to go into news and to be a journalist, you do have to have kind of a high threshold for that kind of news. And I think I do in general, but I agree with you that nobody can take 24 seven of that kind of news diet. So every day in the show, every morning, we have something called the good stuff. We make sure to get in something called the good stuff, which is a totally heartwarming, wonderful story of a hero cop or a little kid with a lemonade stand who's giving all of his proceeds to charity or I mean anything, fill in the blank of something heartwarming because there's a ton of stories out there about people doing good for each other and being human. And that's the rule. I mean, I. I still believe that the rule of thumb is that we are all good people and that we are all trying to help each other and that there is so much humanity out there. But again, news is the unusual. It's not kind of supposed to be the, the 99%. It's supposed to be the other 1% that, that we're covering. So anyway, we try to sneak in good news for sure. And we try to sneak in hero stories for sure. But it's not the majority. Mm -hmm of our newscast. I mean, that's true. And so I just try to find human moments wherever, wherever I can. And I, I agree with you, Olivia, that people need to turn away. When, they, when you feel like your own mental um, system, your own emotional system can't handle all the bad news, and I do have people say that to me, then it's time to just turn it off for a little while, step away. I love doing yoga. I love reading books. I love doing writing. Those are things that like restore me and give me, put me in a better frame of mind. And so I recommend for all of the girls watching, you just have to find what's your happy place and uh, spend some time there every single day to make sure that your mental health, you know, is in check. That's great advice. And I know that your fans do appreciate your efforts to bring some positivity. Um, I read uh, an Instagram comment on your Instagram um, page that said, I love your show with John Berman. When the news these days is so down and depressing, you make us manage to laugh with your back and forth banter. <laughs> I think that, that feedback is just so amazing. I really appreciate that. John is my co-anchor and he is really funny. And I just look for a pocket every day of a time that we, you know, we're no longer in the same studio, okay? So when we were in the same studio, we could have a lot of repartee and jokes back and forth, but now we're not in the same studio. I can go all morning without seeing him, without laying eyes on him in real life. So I still just look for a pocket of humanity where, you know, we can make a joke or something. Just today, he was, we did this just today because he was, we had two guests on who are, you know, wildly impressive people doctors that we're learning so much from and John was complimenting them. He was like, thank you so much. You know, I learned so much from you every morning, Dr. Gupta, and, and thank you. Uh, you know, you're so helpful. And I was like, Ahem. like he wasn't mentioning me. <laughs> <laughs> and so he said you know, something to the effect of, you're my Zen master, Allison, you know that like every day, you know, I mean, he just, he had the perfect comeback. And so every, I, I I see the value in having some humor, even in the darkest Absolutely. time. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit more about walking the dog and yoga and how you balance it all. Because 
you have a big career. I know that your mom to three teenagers probably doing some homeschooling during the pandemic. Um, I also know that you're writing your second book, your memoir. Um, so can you just let us, you know, give us some advice to give the young women here advice on how, how you balance it all. I also know you're very involved in your community. Um, and so just advice on how you balance it and, and especially for women who, who want to have a career and family and, and that full life that you have. Yes, I'm so glad you asked. Um, I think it's completely possible. It is completely possible to fulfill all of your dreams. You can have a family, you can have a rewarding career, and you can do it at the same time. What I have relied on, and I would recommend to everybody, is give up on perfection. Uh, luckily, I have never been cursed with perfection. I never strove for perfection. I hear some people say like, oh, it's, you know, it's really hard when I have my career because I know that I'm not being a perfect mom. Or it's really hard when I'm at home with my kids because I know I'm not being a perfect career woman. Who cares? Who cares? I didn't even, I didn't even know I was supposed to be a perfect mother or a perfect news anchor. I don't even consider that. I operate with the philosophy called good enough. I am good en a good enough parent and I am a good enough journalist and that's it. I'm not even striving for perfection. And so I feel I've always felt that way. And I hope that the girls listening do too. Try your hardest and that's going to be good enough. I mean, if you show up every day, if you're trying, if you're doing your homework, that's it. I mean, I, who, who can ask for more, you know? And I think that in that way, I've been able to juggle a lot of things. I just came in to the house a second ago and we have a rescue dog. So we got her during coronavirus from a shelter. And we'd long been thinking about getting a dog. The kids had wanted a dog for a long time. I'm allergic. So we, we, we had to wait for a hypoallergenic one to come up at the shelter. And she's adorable. And she's a, a Shih Tzu Maltese mix. And when I came in, she was going crazy, like running around, running around, running around. I, was, I, I can't read her mind, but I was thinking, huh, uh, maybe she has to go out right now. But I am supposed to be on the Zoom interview with you guys right now. So I was thinking, but if I don't take her out, she might poop in the house, or I could be a minute late to our interview. And so I decided, okay, I guess I'll take her out. And so I took her out, she wasn't pooping. I had to come back and I thought as I walked through the door, if she poops in the living room, she poops in the living room. And that is my philosophy <laughs> in a nutshell which is in order to do it all, you're going to have to have some poop in the living room at some point. <laughs> okay, I, I, I see some new branded t-shirts. Just let them poop in the living room. <laughs> and actually, the West, the West family was part of the coronavirus puppy boom as well. So we adopted a new mini golden doodle so we can completely relate to, to that story. So. <laughs> That's good. And by the way, that also applies for babies. You can use it for your new rescue dog or babies, which is sometimes you have to let them poop in the living room. And so I, I just have always felt that way. It's not going to be perfect. There's going to be lots of things that fall apart every day in my life. Things fall apart. I mean, but I just live with some level of that chaos. Okay, that is the best yeah, story ever. <laughs> that was the best. That's a great philosophy. <laughs> So you've been, you know, mentioning some of your interviews as we've been talking, and I, of course, have watched you. So can you tell us about one of your favorite interviews? Yes, I would love to tell you about my favorite interview. And my husband always tells me not to tell this story, but here <laughs> goes. He, he doesn't like when I tell this one because he always wants me to answer whenever you ask. He wants me to answer something like Hillary Clinton. So we know when I interviewed Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, about you know what the U.S. was doing in foreign relations, or when I interviewed candidate Donald Trump, and he said it was, and, and he felt that it was such a tough interview that he would never be interviewed by me again. Those are important stories, and those are important interviews. But my favorite interview is not in that category. My favorite interview is okay. Think all of you watching right now, who your like pop star idol was growing up. What boy, if it's Justin Bieber, or if it's Harry Styles, or whoever it is who was your first love, okay, as a kid, 
Mine was a guy <laughs> named, he, he played a character on TV named Keith Partridge. And he was part of the Partridge family. And he was this dreamy, handsome, great singer. I mean, he was the original Justin Bieber. He was Justin Bieber before Justin Bieber. Super cute guy. And I was in love with him. <laughs> And I wrote him love letters starting when I was five years old that I would mail to him. And his real name was David Cassidy. And so when I was about, you know, 30 years old, David Cassidy comes into the studio and I get to interview him. And I was like, run, I was like running around like my Shih Tzu dog was just now. Like I was so excited because basically I was happy for that little girl. I was so happy for my five and six and seven year old self, that this boy that she idolized and had a poster of and wrote fan letters to, that now I was in a position where I was gonna be sitting next to him and asking him questions about his career and like kind of like I was in the driver's seat now. And there was something to me that was so powerful, I don't know, and special that, that the tables had turned, yes, but also that I just had that position of privilege. So that was my favorite interview ever when David Cassidy walked in, into the studio and I became like, you know, a, teen a teenager again. Well, that's another yeah. great story. Um, I'm probably the only other person on the Zoom right now that knows about the Partridge family, but I, exactly. <laughs> so I can really especially appreciate that. Um, so let's talk about mentors. Uh, you, you obviously are one of the most celebrated American journalists. Um, CNN, uh, as CNN anchor, who has mentored you throughout your career and what advice do you have for the young women today about finding sponsorships and mentors um, to help them along in their careers? Because I don't think anyone can do it alone. No way. I am a huge supporter of networking. I really believe in networking. And when I was in high school and college, I got everybody's business card. I just believed in whatever event you went to, be it a birthday party or a, a work networking event, I just really worked it. You know, I, I tried to introduce myself to people. I tried to keep their business cards. I tried to write them emails. I tried to stay in touch with them because I recognize that other people who are ahead of you can open doors for you. You can't kick down every door yourself and you're definitely going to need help. So I have had in my career wonderful bosses and lousy bosses. I've had some lousy bosses that were, you know, abusive with their power. And then I've had some wonderful bosses who were super supportive. And because I'm, you know, older than the girls who are watching, most of my bosses, really the large majority have been men. So now slowly that's changing. But I guess my point is, is that men can be wonderfully supportive mentors or they can be power abusers, you know? I mean, I'm sure women can too. But I didn't just have the option to seek out strong women. I had to seek out strong, generous men too. And you just know when you see one, you know when you find one, when somebody really invests in you and believes in you. And it involves um, constructive criticism. You know, my powerful, uh, my, my strong, male mentors were not just always complimenting me or always handing me things by any stretch. They would say, okay, that stand up that you just did with the microphone, that sucked. <laughs> you're going to do that again. That was the worst thing I've ever seen. Like you're, that color is wrong on you. I don't know what you were saying, but get out there and I'm going to show you how to do it. And you know, sometimes that's hard to hear and it can make you a little bit uncomfortable, but I got better as a result of their constructive criticism. And I knew they were doing it because they wanted me to get better and succeed. And so I just, I'm telling you, you, you must connect um, with people who are in positions of power, male or female, who are ahead of you. And your, your gut will tell you the ones who really can be helpful and supportive to you. And when you find one of them, lasso them, stay in touch with them. Those, I have some bosses from when I was 25 years old that I'm still routinely in touch with today. You know, they've become friends and I just never was out of touch with them because they were so valuable to me. That's great advice. Yeah, that's awesome advice, yeah. 
So let's talk about your book, Amanda Wakes Up, which is about an idealistic morning news anchor covering a crazy presidential race. NPR called it one of the best books of 2017, and Oprah Magazine deemed it a must read. In the book, Amanda learns about the balance of sacrificing for success and staying true to herself. What advice would you give to young people like myself and everyone on this call um, to maintain this balance? Well, thank you for asking me about that. I really enjoyed writing the book. I think that that is the challenge that all of us have throughout life. And all of the young women watching right now, you will have really challenging jobs and careers. And there will always be sacrifices that you have to make. I mean, when I was young in my career, and this happens with Amanda, with breaking news, you can never really have a set schedule. You know, news breaks and you have to get on a plane and you have to fly off and go cover it. I can't tell you how many first dates I had to cancel. And they were dates that I was excited about. You know, I was really excited about it. And it never failed. If I, if I, was, if I had just met somebody and I wanted to go on a date that I was excited about, sure enough, news would break that night. Like, I could go three months without any breaking news and then that night news would break. And so you have to decide what you are willing to sacrifice. Uh, I always hoped that I'd be able to take a rain check and have the date the next week. And for the most part, that worked out. But at some point in your career, you also have to decide when enough is enough. And if you're being too taxed and work is too hard and it's all stress and no fun, and you don't feel like you're getting ahead or making progress, at some point, you also have to make a really tough choice of, is this serving my purpose or should I go look for another job? You know, should I try something else? So all of those, anyway, Amanda in the book, um, I tried to just have her have to wrestle with all of those dilemmas because they're just real life dilemmas. She has a boyfriend who has a very set opinion. She has a mom in the book who has a very set opinion about her career. And Amanda is just trying to juggle it and do the best she can with a demanding boss. And I totally relate to Amanda. A lot in the book is uh, pulled directly from my own real life. And I've been there and everybody will be there. I mean, it, it's a universal experience. You don't have to just be a TV reporter to, have to wrestle with all of this. It, these are choices that you all have to make. And you know, I, I guess my advice is that you just have to be true to yourself. You have to be true to yourself and follow your own North Star and you'll know when something is, you're just on the wrong path. And it's really hard to write yourself and recalibrate, but that's, that's what it will take to be successful. And it's such a relevant book, and I, I read it, and I highly encourage our, um, our, our older young women to read it. But um, I always say that when you start believing in yourself, other people will believe in you too. So it's so such a powerful book and, and such a relevant message for, for young women. I really, I really am glad you brought that up because, I mean, I think what you're talking about is confidence, and I know that that's part of your mission statement, and you guys tout that all the time. And it is true. You, you are in charge of your own confidence. You know, you are in charge of it. And I am a believer in the fake it till you make it mm -hmm. um, school of thought, which is you walk in the door, head high, shoulders back, you act confident and people around you will start treating you as though you are confident. You know, it's this virtuous circle. And so um, I think that that's, it's all, and, and the beautiful thing about it is that Nobody has to bestow that on you. You cultivate your own confidence. Be as prepared as you can be, obviously, for your job. And that will instill confidence in you. And then it's up to you. And I think that it is contagious. Like con uh, confidence is contagious. When you act that way, people get that impression of you. Absolutely. So I'm gonna ask one more question and then we'll give the girls an opportunity to ask you a few questions. So while I ask this question, girls, if you, if you, if you have a question, please put it in our participant raise your hand function. Um, but so my last question, Allison, is one of the many, many reasons that I admire you as a leader is that you give so much back to your community. And I know that you're involved in many organizations, the National Infertility Association, the News Literacy Project and DreamYard. But also, it's amazing how you've created a community with your own fans and supporters. And just for anyone looking through your Instagram with over 52,000 followers, 
all of the loving, positive, authentic comments in your community are just incredible. I mean, you're posting updates on your memoir and people are encouraging you and, and it's just incredible. So can you just talk a little bit about what community means to you and why it's so important for you to give back? Thank you for that question. And let me just start by saying that it wasn't always that way. Right now on social media, I agree. I have a super supportive community and I really gain a lot of sustenance and positivity from them. But for a few years, I was on Twitter and I found that community, at least on my Twitter feed, to be kind of toxic. It was toxic. Uh, there was a lot of political stuff flying around and a lot of insulting stuff. And so much so that I would check out. I just wouldn't even engage for long periods of time. And when I would come back and check on my Twitter feed, there'd been a food fight in my absence. Like people yelling at each other, calling each other names. I, I was sort of not even involved in the food fight. And I thought, this is a toxic playground that I don't want to be involved in. And so I publicly broke up with Twitter. I wrote it like a breakup note and publicly like put it out on, on um, CNN.com. And I uh, never, never looked back. I, I, I broke up with them, I never went back to Twitter. So I guess my point is, is that social media is a double-edged sword. It can be a community, and I am proud that I now have a supportive community, but it can also be, and I'm sure that all the girls watching know this, toxic and unhealthy. And you have to decide if something is draining you of your positive energy, you don't need to be on that site. You know, you don't need to engage. There's no law that says you have to be on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you know, name your poison, whichever one isn't serving your needs. So I just checked out of Twitter because I do think to your larger question that a community is really important. It was important to me in my teenage years, really important. I had a huge support network of friends and of their families that sort of became my surrogate families if I didn't happen to be with my own family at that time. And so I think I get a lot of power from community and from friends. In fact, during COVID, it's been hard for me not to be physically around my friends. They're really important to me. So social media definitely helps connect, um, but just make sure that you're using it in a positive way. You know, make sure you're not spreading any toxins and you don't have to be on the receiving end of any toxicity. That's a great message. Mm -hmm. Thank you for emphasizing, because I agree it can be positive and it's all up to us to, to make sure it's, it's used for good. Um, so we're gonna um, take just a few questions from the girls. They're all really excited to meet you. Um, and we're gonna start first with Victoria. Um, and Victoria, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Allison. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's really an honor to get to speak with you and hear from you all this wonderful advice. Um, so my question for you is, has a lot to do with journalism because I also had dreams of becoming a journalist uh, before I went to school and decided my major. And I was wondering, have you ever been nervous to go in to investigate a story or ask any questions? Thank you, Victoria, for that great question. I mean, that is the heart of the matter with journalists, particularly if you're going to be covering tough stories. For five years, I was a crime reporter. And as a crime reporter, I worked on the show called America's Most Wanted. And what that show was about was catching fugitives. And uh, they, sometimes they'd been on the run for 10 years and police couldn't find them. Sometimes they'd done the most heinous crimes, murders, rapes, and police were looking for them. And so it was my job to, once the show captured them, and the show captured them all the time, we had a huge success rate, to go into the jail cell with a microphone and be like, hi, what do you have to say to the victim's family? Why did you do it? And ask them in their jail cell or say like, are you guilty? And it was definitely nerve wracking. I mean, I really loved it because I love justice and I like criminal justice, but there were definitely times when I was alone in a jail cell with a murderer or a serial rapist, and my I would have my cameraman nearby, but he wasn't with me yet because he was setting up a camera somewhere else. And I would be thinking, huh, I really hope this guy doesn't like take me hostage right now. 
I guess I'm just going to ask him, like, can I get you anything? Do you need some water or soda or anything? I mean, it was definitely nerve wracking. And so I tried to take as few risks as possible in that situation, make sure I knew where the warden was, make sure my cameraman was nearby. But the field of journalism is, comes with risks. I mean, risks are inherent in it. And I liked that. I mean, you know, I liked being on the front lines of some of that stuff. So you definitely have to accept that there'll be some risk and you have to have kind of the um, intestinal fortitude to think that you'll be able to get through some of those riskier situations. And one last thing I want to say is that everything I've just described is nothing compared to some of my colleagues who are on the front lines in war zones. I mean, I think of Clarissa Ward, one of our fantastic international correspondents, a woman named Arwa Damon. You guys should check out their stuff. They are in Syria. They go into Afghanistan. They're on the front lines in war zones. And so, you know, a mere mass murderer that I'm in a cell with alone is child's play compared to what they're doing. So you have to be willing to take some risk. It's true. Thank you so much. Thanks for the question. Okay, next we have Lola, who is a middle schooler. Lola, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah. Hi, Allison. I just wanted Hello. to say that you're an amazing inspiration. And my question is, what motivated you to become a journalist in the first place? Well, I remember the moment it happened. I remember the moment, like the aha moment, the light bulb. I was watching TV after mm -hmm. school, as I often did. I, you know, before there was social media, we had our different kind of screen time and I was kind of addicted to television. And there used to be a talk show of a guy, a talk show host named Phil Donahue. And what he used to do was every day he'd have a different subject matter and he had a live audience and he would have a microphone and he would run around his live audience having people in the audience ask questions of the guests. And it was very lively and it was provocative and every day was a different topic. And I really remember being on the sofa and thinking to myself, what's that called? What's that job called that he's doing? And somebody told me it was called broadcast journalism. And from that point, I wanted to be a broadcast journalist. And so at 15 years old, I just started, once I had that bee in my bonnet, you know, that idea, I just started thinking, how can I, how will I ever be able to do that? I don't know anybody in TV news. I don't know anybody who's a broadcast journalist. But what I did in high school, um, when I was a junior, so I was 16, is that there was a local radio station. There was a, a local college, and that college had a campus radio station. And I knew somebody who went to that college, and I asked if they knew anybody at the radio station. And long story short, they let me read the news on the college campus radio station because nobody else wanted it. That's and so, so at night, on Wednesday nights, I know, I mean, I can't believe nobody wanted to. From like 6 p.m. to 11, every half an hour, I would do these radio updates about international news. I was petrified. I sucked. I was, if anybody has those audio tapes out there, I hope they'll destroy them right now. And, but, but for me, it was so exhilarating. Like, it was... It was so thrilling to just, I, I had my script and the red light would go on and I would be like, good evening, everyone. It is the latest out of Saudi Arabia. Like, I didn't even know what I was saying. <laughs> so, um, it was a great experience and it still let me make contacts because there were other students who worked at the radio station. And so anyway, uh, that's how it all started. And I'm really grateful that I had that experience and I'm grateful that I got to be really, really bad there before I had to do it for real. That's awesome. Thank you for answering my question. Thanks so much. And again, Allison, I just wanna say I'm probably the only other person who, who knows the Phil Donahue reference, but I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really um, getting old school here, aren't I? <laughs> So next, we have Abnerlene Massinat, who is a high, rising high school senior. Hi, Allison. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you are definitely an inspiration. I love CNN. I love watching um, you guys on CNN. So my question for you is, as a woman um, in the field of work that you enter, 
that you are in. Can you give us some advice about, you know, advocating for yourself as a woman and how to speak out in situations where you're where you either feel minimized or disregarded? So, um, Shari, it was hard for me to hear. Um, Emily, did you were you able to hear her question? Yeah. So Abnerlene, Abnerlene asked about any advice you have as a young woman if you're ever kind of marginalized in a situation or does, if your voice is discounted in any way, how, you know, any advice on how to handle that? It's really a tough one. It's a great question and it happens all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to have to report, it happens all the time. Obviously, we're trying to make strides. We're trying to change the culture and the more female bosses there are out there, the better it will become. Um, but we're still in transition. You know, I just did a story this morning about how sexual harassment is still running rampant at some networks. And it's really sad because I thought that over these past years, with it being so public and the conversation being so public that we were really making big strides. And I think we are making big strides in terms of talking about it, but the culture has not changed overnight, obviously. Um, so in terms of being marginalized and in terms of your voice not being heard, you know, what I have found um, effective in other women, I've watched them do this, is when they're, let's say we're in a big conference room and they make a point or they ask a question and nobody says anything. And then invariably a male colleague will say the exact same thing and the boss will say, great point, Joe. I find it's effective when the woman says, just to be clear, I just made that point a moment ago. Am I right, ladies? You know, I think that for a long time, we sort of suffered in silence and that didn't work. It didn't make any progress to suffer in silence and to not speak up. And so while it is hard and um, uncomfortable to have to interrupt and say, I thought I just made that point. Or if you all were listening, I made a very similar point five minutes ago, but no one said anything. That feels like very uncomfortable but I think that it does help break the taboo about talking about it. And whenever a woman has done it, and I've heard a woman do that, it's very effective. It does bring the room to kind of like a record scratching, you know, it, it, ever, it gets everybody's attention. And so I think that that's what we're gonna have to do for a while because just being silent, just being polite, just hoping that somebody someday is gonna notice just hasn't worked for these generations. So I think raising your hand and making those points, you know, obviously not super aggressively, but assertively is the point that we're at right now that I see working. Great, and, yeah. and great. And Allison, I know we have many more questions, but based on time, I just wanna hand it back to you. Um, you've already given us so much brilliant advice, but um, and just any closing words or advice that you want to give to these young women. And I always like to say, as you look out across the Zoom, I think you have to keep scrolling to the right to, for the many different pages to see everyone. But I mean, these are the, uh, the fa faces of the future. These are the faces of the CEOs and the doctors and the lawyers and the business owners and the Nobel Peace Prize winners. Um, and they give me so much hope. Uh, any, any closing comments you'd like to offer to, to these young women today? Oh my gosh, I have so many, but basically it's just, you know, it won't be easy, but it's worth it. It's worth it. And so just keep working hard and recognize there are um, three steps forward, two steps back. Nothing is a straight line. My career has been a winding road and yours may be too. There's no such thing as, you know, solely an upward trajectory. There are days that stink and days that are successes and just get used to the, you know, the feeling of three steps forward and one step back, you know, three steps forward, one step back. And so it's okay if you have a day where not everything goes perfectly, that's part of the learning experience. But, you know, you know, set your sights on a goal, set your sights on a really big goal and an important goal, and just every day do something to move towards that. And one last thing, because I'm writing this book, this memoir right now about the very age that you are, keep a journal. You know, I am so, I'm so happy that I have some journals to fall back on and rely on because it's really interesting to go back and see my 
13 year old self and my 14 year old self and my 15 year old self. I was a highly emotional teenager. My journal entries are filled with episodes of me crying. And it's interesting to see that. I think that's normal. I and mean, I think that we are, you know, obviously emotional, very emotional creatures in our teens and beyond. But it's also just really rewarding to see how far I've come and to see that I have tackled some of the issues that I thought were so important back then. I'm a big believer in journaling, and I think that it's helpful just in your life to process things. So I really recommend, if you're not doing that, that you do that. And, you know, just again, um, have faith, keep your sights set on where you want to go. And I know that you guys, I mean, you have such a great network even here of support and community that I know you'll be able to achieve it. That's so true. This sisterhood is powerful. And thank you so much, Allison, from the bottom of my heart, from Olivia's, from, from all of us. Thank you for being a champion for girls and women. Thank you for supporting our mission. And you can know that uh, we'll be watching tomorrow morning and every morning and um, that we'll continue to be your biggest fangirls. And we appreciate all that you have done. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you so guys. much. Thank you guys for the conversation and the great questions. It's been so wonderful to talk to you guys and and meet you virtually. So I look forward to talking again. Bye, everyone. Wait, bye. 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 Thank, Thank you so you. much.